All right, so we're going to learn a little bit about taxonomy and nomenclature, the sciences of sorting and organizing plants and the sciences of naming plants. Carl Linnaeus, uh, Carl von Linn, or Linnaeus, uh, was kind of a jack of all trades, actually. He was a Swedish botanist, but he did a lot of other things. And he is the one who is basically responsible for making us learn all of these Latin names. He's not the first to recognize that what they were doing before that kind of sucked, um, but his is the system that we're basically using today. What he looked at was prior to his invention of what we call binomial nomenclature, we would name plants based on their description. So Acer palmatum, which is Japanese maple, would be called Acer orientalis heterofolio. All right, that's four terms. That's, that's not that bad. You know, maple, an oriental maple with ivy leaves. Okay, that's not so bad. But what about the florist's carnation? I'm sure most of you have either gotten or given those carnations. You can buy them in, the, in, in most stores. That plant's name used to be Dianthus floribus solitaris squamus calicinus subovatus brevissimus corollus carnatus. How many terms is that? That's the problem. We didn't know how many terms a plant's name was going to be because when people found new plants, they just started describing it. And when they were done describing it, that was the plant's name. And Linnea said, this sucks. So now each plant has one true name and each name has two parts, the genus and the specific epithet. So we've got two sciences, taxonomy, the science of classifying things, sorting things, and nomenclature, the science of naming things. Why do we need to sort things out and then give them a name? Well, it's really hard to communicate with somebody if you can't name what you're talking about. So obviously things need a name, right? But we also have to sort them because we're human beings and we like to sort. We sort stuff all the time. We sort laundry. Some people go so far as to sort it in the colds and the warms. Some people sort it once it's done. Your underwear goes here, your socks go there, your shirts go there, your pants go there. Some people sort very simply. This is the dirty pile, this is the clean pile. We sort stuff all the time. And we name things all the time because we can't talk about something if we don't know what its name is. So this is the basic system that Linnaeus came up with. And you don't need to memorize this, but kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And I used to remember this by Kelly put chocolate on Fred's green shoes. And we've modernized it a little bit because we recognize that what he was able to see in the mid-1700s and what we're able to see right now with modern technology are vastly different. All right, so we have a domain that's higher than kingdom. Some people call phylum the division nowadays. Then we have subphylum, superclass, class, subclass, order, family, genus, species, and subspecies. If you'll notice, all of the terms are basically still there. We've just now recognized that some things don't fit nice and neat into these categories, so we had to come up with other categories to make it work. Don't write this down. This is the taxonomic classification for red maples. Right? And you can look at all of the different living organisms can fall into this type of classification. What we're going to work with most of the time is right down here. Occasionally we'll work with varieties or cultivars, but most of the time what we're going to be looking at is family, genus, and then the species. Okay, so if you were to design a classification system right now for plants, how could you do it? You could classify them in any way that you wanted to. You could classify them by leaves, Leaf shape, leaf color, flower color, habit, tree, shrub, perennial, maybe how you use them. You know, so that way maybe we classify instead of a tomato being a fruit because that's exactly what it is, we're going to classify it as a vegetable because that's how we use it. Well, he didn't actually use any of those things. He used flowering structures. Now there's problems with this because the flowering structures are only on the plant for a short period of time. Particularly when it comes to our trees, they may only be in flower for, for a week, maybe 10 days. So why would he choose that? Well, he chose it because flowering structures are what we call conserved, meaning they don't change easily from one generation to the next generation. If you are a crab apple and you want to make more crab apples, you have to be able to interact with other crab apples. 
if you are a crab apple and suddenly all of your flowers are vastly different because of some genetic mutation or some environmental issue, then you can't interact with other crab apples, making it very difficult for you to make more crab apples, which is the plant's goal, to make more of that species. All right, so there are some terms that we need to know. A genus is a group of organisms with similar characteristics. Domestic cats, Felis. Acer, all maples. Sedum, all stone crops. Maples all have things in common with all other maples. Think about it. Think about those all those little helicopters that you see on the ground. All maples produce those. Regardless of other differences, all of them produce those. Then we have a species, a group of organisms with similar characteristics that can reproduce from one generation to the next. Acer rubrum is not Acer rubrum unless it can make more Acer rubrum. Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower, is not Echinacea purpurea unless it can make more Echinacea purpureas. If you are a species and you cannot reproduce, you're not very successful as a species. Sometimes we have natural changes in the plant. And we call that a variety. Variety means difference or change. And sometimes Mother Nature comes up with these changes. Uh, so you might see, for example, Cornus, Florida, variety, Rubra. All right, that would be a pink flowering dogwood. Most of our dogwoods are white flowering. But occasionally they flower pink, and that happened in, in nature. Now, if we take a look at cultivar, and you can see the words cultivated variety right there, cultivated variety. This is something that we came up with. We bred for this change, we hybridized for this change, and we want to make sure that that change is stable from every generation to the next generation so we can enjoy that particular change. So we might have Coreopsis, Verticillata, Moonbeam. That happens to be a very pale yellow flowering tick seed. And every time we breed for that, that pale yellow color needs to come through. We occasionally see intergeneric hybrids, a cross between two different genera. Doesn't happen very often. That's basically like a maple and an oak breeding together. So they really have to be closely related. It, doesn't, it does happen occasionally, but not very often. What does happen a little more often is an interspecific hybrid, a cross between two species with, within a genus. So a maple and a maple hybridizing, an oak and an oak hybridizing. And while we're not going to pay a whole lot of attention to them in this class, we do have trademarks, patented names for money so that the companies that invent these plants can make money off of their inventions. So how do we name plants? The genus is the first part of the scientific name. Now note that this is different from the definition. The specific epithet is the second part of the scientific name. By itself, the second part is absolutely meaningless. You can't go to somebody in a nursery and say, run out back and grab the rubrum. Uh, what, uh, what, excuse me? No. You can say, run out back and grab the acer. The next question should probably be which ones, but at least you would know where all of the maples are. So all things fall into this, including humans. So if you look at humans, our genus is Homo. Our specific epithet, I cannot spell, is Sapiens. And our species is Homo sapiens. So everything falls into this category. So how do we write a cultivar? We write it within single quotes. You saw that with uh, Coreopsis just a minute ago. So I'm not going to write out the whole thing. I'll write, I'll kind of abbreviate. Notice the single quotes. A trademark, probably the most common one that you might see for a trademark. Our knockout roses, which are either going to be followed by a TM. Occasionally, a company will trademark to do a registered trademark. Uh, that's important because now somebody else cannot produce knockout roses. Only the people that have been given legal permission to produce knockout roses can produce them. But how much is enough? How much is, is too much? 
So here we've been, we've gone to a company called Terranova. As you can see by their video, they are a wholesale grower. So we're going to look at one of their plants that they're well known for. And they breed many, many cultivars of heuchera or corobel every year. But take a look at how many purple-leaved ones there are. And just how many purple-leaved ones do we need in our gardens? If we have an interspecific hybrid, remember that's a cross between two different species within a genus. It's going to be indicated by this X between the genus and the specific epithet. So we might have something like Gallardia. Notice the X. Gallardia grandiflora. An intergeneric hybrid is indicated by an X before the genus. So we might have X, which we're not necessarily saying. Compressus cypress lilandii is a cross between a compressus and a cypress. Usually the name gives you some sort of indication of which two genera were used to make this, this cross. But again, the plants have to be pretty closely related. We don't really see that very often. And he picked Latin. Why? Why would he pick Latin? Nobody, who speaks Latin anymore? Nobody speaks Latin anymore. I don't speak Latin. The Pope. The Pope speaks Latin. That's about it. Really not many people speak Latin. So why would he pick that? If you were to pick a language today, what would you pick? Well, you'd pick English because you speak English. And in fact, much of science is conducted in the English language. English has become the language of science. Well, back when he was doing this in the 1700s, you're talking mid 1700s, Latin was the language of science. So that's why he picked Latin. It's worked out pretty well for us uh, because Latin has since become a dead language, it doesn't change. The meaning of the word Acer will never change. Spoken language changes all the time. And if you don't think so, ask yourself if your parents understand your slang. They probably don't. At some point, your children will not understand your slang. You don't understand your parents' slang because the meaning of the words change. The meaning of the word might change in different cultures. What is a flat? A flat depends upon whether you're an American or a British. The British think that's an apartment. For us, that's a flat tire. Right? So it does have some problems, but they are hard to remember and they're hard to pronounce and they are hard to spell relative to common names, which even if you don't know the plant, you know, even if you don't know the plant porcelain vine, well, those aren't scary words. I can probably figure out how to spell that, how to remember it. But if I say Ampelopsis brevipedunculata, well, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? So it sounds scarier. But if you walk into a nursery in Japan and you say Acer rubrum, they can take you to the proper plants. So we're going to do a little assignment and we're going to create our own taxonomic system. There's another little video plus the... Uh, um, on Carmen, there's the assignment itself, and we're going to create a taxonomy of sandwiches. So that's going to be your kind of in-class or your week-long assignment. There's another video for that. As always, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to get in contact.